어, 다음은 블록체인 투자사 해시드와 그 자회사 해시드 오픈 리서치의 산업 정책 커뮤니티 커뮤니티 HDOL 해시드 오픈 다이얼로그 폴러를 출범시켜서 어, 전 세계 블록체인 규제를 논의하면서 활발히 활동 중이신 강병진 법무실장님이 진행을 맡으시고 어, 미 증권 선물 거래위원회와 더불어 디지털 자산 시장에 대한 규제를 총괄할 감독 기구로 유력하게 거론되고 있는 미국 상품 거래위원회 상임위원 캐롤라인 팜 위원님이 혁신을 위한 디지털 자산 규제 제언을 주제로 이야기합니다. 박수 부탁드립니다. 안녕하세요. 해시드 법무총괄 강병진입니다. Um, today, I have the utmost honor of introducing Commissioner Caroline Pham from CFTC. So without further ado, uh, Commissioner Pham, welcome to Busan. Um, please tell us a little bit about CFTC and its role and what do you do on, um, at CFTC? Well, thank you so much for having me here. It's really wonderful to be back again in South Korea, particularly as you heard me say yesterday during the 70th anniversary of the alliance between the United States and the Republic of Korea. So I have to give my standard disclaimer, which is that the views I share today are just those of my own in my official capacity as a commissioner and do not necessarily represent that of the CFTC or of any other commissioner. So I'm very happy to tell you more about the CFTC. The Commodity Futures Trading Commission is like a board of directors. There are five independent commissioners, three from the president's party and two from the other party, and one of the commissioners is designated as chairman, just like a board of directors. And so we are the head of the agency, and for all of the actions that the agency does, whether it's passing rules or bringing enforcement actions, it all requires a vote of the commissioners. We are very much like the SEC, only we don't cover the securities markets. And in fact, I like to say that the biggest way to distinguish between the SEC and us is that if it doesn't involve the securities markets, then probably we have some regulatory touch points over it. And what are some of the powers that the CFTC has? In the United States, regulatory agencies typically have three key tools that they use. One is the authority to regulate, which is to pass rules and regulations. Second is the authority to inspect or examine registered firms. And three, the power to enforce. And that's been very evident, particularly in many of the enforcement actions that we've brought over the fraud and abuses in the crypto sector. Thank you. And in terms of CFTC's involvement regarding digital assets, um, could you tell us a little bit about some of your inception and history regarding your treatment of digital assets from the CFTC? One thing that I feel makes me almost one of the uh, original in the crypto sector is that I first started looking at cryptocurrency in 2013 when I was at the CFTC previously working for a former commissioner. And at that time, we looked at Bitcoin to determine whether or not the CFTC had jurisdiction over Bitcoin. And we did determine that the CFTC does have jurisdiction over Bitcoin because it was a commodity. And this was later formally recognized in one of our enforcement orders in 2015. And since that time, we have looked at different types of cryptocurrencies or other digital assets and have identified them as commodities subject to the CFTC's enforcement jurisdiction or if there are listed futures contracts or other derivatives on these commodities. And that includes uh, not just Bitcoin, but also Ether and other coins like Litecoin or Dogecoin. Great. And regarding some of your recent updates, uh, I saw on November 6th that you had a very important meeting under your leadership at the GMAC. Um, could you tell the audience what the GMAC is all about and what your leadership role is in the, uh, in the committee? 
So one of the things that I've been very pleased to do as a commissioner, particularly given my former role as a global bank executive, is to promote international engagement, cooperation, and collaboration so that we have strong international standards for our global markets. And part of that is my sponsorship of the CFTC's Global Markets Advisory Committee, which is an independent committee comprised of experts from the public including many industry experts, uh, many leaders, CEOs, and other C-suite executives from exchanges, clearing houses, banks, asset managers, service providers, regulators, and more. I'm very proud that under my sponsorship, the GMAC is actually the largest single advisory committee initiative that the CFTC has ever sponsored, with 127 members including from Fortune 100 companies across the GMAC and its three subcommittees on global market structure, technical issues, and digital asset markets. One of the key things I did to launch the GMAC, which is focused on having a level playing field for global businesses and global markets, is last year I undertook an international listening tour. And I went and engaged with about a dozen different jurisdictions, talking to central bankers, finance ministers, policymakers, and other leaders about the challenges that we are facing, both from a macroeconomic and geopolitical lens, but also in understanding the shifts in capital flows, investment, and the response to innovation all around the world. Great. And in addition to that, two months ago, you've also launched the Digital Assets Pilot Program. Um, could you tell us a little bit of some of the developments that you've had and what could be the path forward for this pilot program? One of the things that I wanted to really distinguish my commissionership was my focus on practical solutions and taking a pragmatic approach to the challenges we face in our markets. So that's why at the November 6th meeting, like you just mentioned, my GMAC in just nine short months developed eight recommendations, which they voted on to approve and send to the commission for consideration for a future policy proposal or to recommend for international standards. And in that same approach of identifying solutions and ways to tackle novel or emerging areas, I recently proposed a digital asset markets pilot program that the CFTC could sponsor as a type of regulatory sandbox in the United States. One of the things that is very unique about the US regulatory framework is that the CFTC and the SEC are primarily enforcement agencies. That is the main power that we use and it's a trade-off between having, on the one hand, um, a principles-based regulatory framework, but on the other hand, having very strong and robust enforcement powers. So it's not as easy in the United States to have a typical regulatory sandbox like you might find in the UK or in Singapore or even here in South Korea. But we have had success in the past with pilot programs. And as all of you are very familiar in the private sector, it's very common to have a proof of concept or a pilot to test out a new um, market structure, a new product, or a new technology. So what I propose is that the CFTC use the same pilot approach for changes in market structure or new technologies like DLT and tokenization. And what this could be is um, something that would be for one year, for example. And we would have clear guidelines for eligibility or registration, minimum requirements for contract terms or product listings. We would have risk management, financial resources, disclosures, and conduct requirements. And this would enable us to test out something new in a controlled environment so that we could gather data, analyze that data, and then decide whether or not to make these changes permanent through a rulemaking. And in fact, it's not the first time that the CFTC has done something like a pilot program or the SEC. The CFTC used pilot programs more frequently in the 1990s when there was a lot of innovation in financial products. And the SEC has been using pilot programs over the last decade to test out things like a tick-sized pilot program for equity market structure. Great. 
Uh, speaking of the SEC, I think some within the industry uh, have a misconception that the Bitcoin ETF has been approved. Could you actually elucidate the audience in terms of what the court ruling said? And could you um, offer your personal opinion whether that beacons the start of uh, institutionalization of digital assets in the United States? The subject or topic of a Bitcoin, a spot Bitcoin ETF in the United States has been very closely watched for a number of years now, ever since the SEC rejected the first spot Bitcoin ETF, I think even in 2017 or 2018. So it's been about five years now that um, people have unsuccessfully tried to launch a spot Bitcoin ETF in the United States. Now, Bitcoin futures ETFs have been approved uh, by the SEC and those do trade, but not a spot Bitcoin ETF. Recently, there was a court opinion that looked at the SEC's rejection of one of the spot Bitcoin ETFs and said, essentially, that the SEC did not follow the appropriate administrative process under the law that applies to regulators like the SEC and the CFTC. And because they did not follow the appropriate process, they needed to go back and do it again the right way, which primarily is focused on explaining better the rationale for the SEC to have rejected the spot Bitcoin ETF. And indeed, I think one of the questions that has been raised is why could the SEC approve a Bitcoin futures ETF yet reject a spot Bitcoin ETF? What is the difference there? So basically what this means is that the SEC needs to reassess the application and follow the correct process to analyze it. And if it is rejected, it must be explained much better with more detail and rationale the basis for that rejection. People have reacted to this with optimism because they feel that perhaps the courts will make the SEC approve a spot Bitcoin ETF, but that may be reading a little too much into the decision. And in terms of decentralized finance, I think um, the industry has its own set of challenges and also promises. Uh, what are some of the unique considerations when it comes to decentral finance for a regulator for, like yourself? And what do you think is the potential role and opportunities within decentralized finance? One of the unique things about decentralized finance that people are excited about is that it can utilize smart contracts to handle certain uh, functions automatically. This is very exciting for what it may mean as far as improving efficiencies and reducing frictions or having uh, more direct transactions that do not use intermediaries. And with much of the advancements in digital assets or in tokenized finance, I believe that there are sometimes a lot of new words being used for old things. So here with the smart contracts, they are very similar to an algorithm. And that's why I believe that one prudent way to approach decentralized finance would be to look at how we handle the regulation of algorithmic trading in our markets and to apply some of the same concepts for liability, risk management, and controls. So overall, I think that would be a good place to start. It would not be uh, so hard to extend our current framework for algorithmic trading over the use of smart contracts in decentralized finance than, for example, coming up with something new. Now, what the CFTC and the SEC have done in the United States, um, which is typical for the crypto sector, is we have brought enforcement actions over DeFi markets that we feel do not comply with the rules. And so one of the misconceptions is because something is decentralized, it means that it is not regulated, which is not true. Just as the people try to say that the internet is not regulated, but that's not true, the activities that you do on the internet are in fact subject to regulation. And so the activities that you would do on a decentralized protocol particularly if they are financial activities, must comply with financial regulations. Recently, the CFTC brought an enforcement action against certain decentralized derivatives trading platforms for failing to appropriately register with the CFTC, either as 
a exchange or a derivatives trading facility. So I think this is one other point that is important, is some people have said that the CFTC has tried to go after code or software developers, and that's not quite true. What the orders in this instance said is that they were operating a derivatives trading platform, and if you do that, you have to comply with the registration rules. And I think the key word you mentioned was activities. And I think you've been trying to emphasize uh, financial and commercial activities when it comes to blockchain and digital assets. Could you tell us how you distinguish those two activities and what do they mean for the industry? When I think about digital assets, to me, it really means that it is a digital representation of some type of asset. And that asset could be um, a digital right, to use something or to own something or transfer something, or it can be something that is a, a digital representation of a tangible item, or it could be something that is non-tangible and is instead a virtual uh, item or content or almost anything. And it's very broad. So if we think about it that way, and we realize that the tokenized piece of what a digital asset is, is really just a technology wrapper. The same way that when you unwrap a present, you want to see what is inside it. So the fact that something is tokenized does not change what is actually underlying it. And from a legal and regulatory perspective, particularly from a US legal and regulatory perspective, it really is that underlying asset that must be analyzed in order to determine what are the laws and regulations that apply. So I will give a couple examples. For a digital asset, the asset could be money, for example, like with CBDCs or stable coins, or it could be uh, non, not money, something besides money. And if it's some other kind of asset, it could be a financial asset or a non-financial asset. So by looking at it in these three broad categories, I think it becomes more simple and easy to apply. If we are talking about money, then it could be public money, which would be the CBDCs or some type of digital fiat currency, or it could be private money, things like tokenized deposits, commercial bank money, or non-bank issued stable coins. I believe that tokenized money, whether public or private, is going to be subject to the laws that we have around the world for banking and payment products. And that is important for monetary policy and global financial stability. If we then look at other types of assets, if we are talking about a financial asset or financial activities involving uh, financial assets, then clearly that must be subject to the financial regulations that we have in place that have been upheld by international standard setting bodies like the Financial Stability Board and the International Organization of Securities Commissions. And that's important, again, in order to protect financial stability and to address systemic risk and a lot of hard lessons that have been learned through various banking and market crises, particularly the 2008 great financial crisis. You may have heard the term same activity, same risk, same regulation, and that is indeed the approach that the global regulators are taking to tokenized financial assets. When we think about non-financial assets, I like to think about this as commercial activity. And we have heard a lot over the past day and today about real world utility, including in Dr. Kim's excellent speech. And we have heard about how uh, activities using blockchain, for example, shipping, logistics, other enterprise applications involving a supply chain, or records management, like electronic health records. All of these are commercial applications using blockchain technology. And just the same way that even though a securities exchange is a marketplace for trading securities, and eBay or Amazon are marketplaces for trading goods, the laws and regulations that apply to each are very different. So speaking of these activities, I think it's a nice segue into Korea and also Busan. 
Um, when it comes to digital assets regulation, I used to think um, differentiate, them, differentiate them in three phases. So phase one is you know FATF, AML kind of uh, regulatory framework, and then phase two would be about investor protection. And then phase three would be um, industry regulatory framework such as the EU's uh, MICA. And so South Korea is currently at phase two in terms of um, having uh, passed the Investor Protection Act for digital assets. How would you evaluate um, South Korea in terms of its phases? And what are some of the recommendations that you would have for going to phase three? So from my perspective, and this is speaking very broadly, I think that when we are talking about promoting innovation or fair competition, which is an important mandate of the CFTC, we need to think about using a principles-based regulatory framework. And this is important for several reasons. First of all, a principles-based regulatory framework is more flexible and it can adapt and anticipate new innovations more quickly. So that way we are not playing catch up to the developments, but we are able to evolve the regulatory framework alongside the changes in the market or the technology. So that is very important. The other reason why I think a principles-based regulatory framework is important is because there's just not possible to see into the future and to anticipate every type of different development or technology or use case or market participant. And in order to ensure that the regulatory framework stays as evergreen as possible, having a principles-based regulatory framework allows you to not have to be changing the rules every time, which is a very lengthy process, particularly in the United States, and can take uh, several years in order to change the rules. And another reason why I support a principles-based regulatory framework is because it requires that the industry be responsible. They also must be accountable for the activities that they engage in and for protecting their customers. And so that's why in the United States, we have a system of self-regulation where the exchanges and the clearinghouses have their own market rules that they enforce and they can fine uh, trading firms and other participants on those exchanges if they break those rules. So these are three reasons why I think a principles-based regulatory framework is very important and can be more fitting for things where we're talking about uh, the real economy in particular and different changes that might happen in the real economy. Now, besides having a principles-based regulatory framework, one thing that I think it is important for regulators to do is to try to develop as much expertise as possible in the industries that they are regulating and that's why engagement with the private sector and having forums like the Global Markets Advisory Committee that I sponsor is very productive for an exchange of ideas and information and in helping the regulators be as best equipped as possible to do their jobs. Great. Um, and so Busan yesterday has announced a lot of doctrines and a lot of initiatives, including the Digital Assets Exchange. Uh, what are some of your uh, recommendations for operating such platform? So unfortunately, I am not allowed to provide any recommendations or advice, but I always say that 90% of anything that you are doing is following the advice that your parents taught you. Don't lie, don't cheat, and don't steal. And at least in the United States, for the other 10%, get a good securities lawyer. <laughs> Very expensive. <laughs> okay. Um, and so this marks um, the second time that you've visited South Korea um, this year. Uh, what draws you to Korea? And also, you're here in Busan, I believe, for the first time. Um, tell us a little bit more about your experience in Busan. So I first began working uh, with colleagues in Asia and in businesses in Asia when I was in my former role as a global bank executive at Citigroup. So this is probably in 2015 or so. And what I always enjoyed working with my colleagues in Asia and in the projects that I undertook where I would come and do assignments uh, on the ground in Asia was the tremendous energy and approach to innovation, which is open-minded, uh, quick, uh, adoption and um, a very 
um, open citizenship that understands and, and knows how to use technology. All of these are incredible ingredients for fast growth. And I often say that when I come to Asia, I feel like I'm looking into the future. It's perhaps 10 years ahead of what we might see adopted on a broad scale in the United States. And what's interesting to me is that just the same way that Seoul many years ago looked into the future and saw that it should be an internet city, I see the same thing here in Busan, looking into the future and recognizing that it should be a blockchain city. So these are some of the things that are very exciting to talk to entrepreneurs and founders and businesses here in South Korea is that forward-looking uh, openness and focus on growth. And I think that that's very important, particularly because, and you noticed that this is the second time I've been in South Korea this year, with the reaffirmation of our strong friendship and partnership with the Republic of Korea, the 70th anniversary of our alliance, and the important strides that we have made towards shared prosperity and both economic and national security in the region, and the Republic of Korea's strong leadership in the Indo-Pacific economic framework. These are all reasons why I'm very pleased to be able to come here to Korea to show support for our friendship and to recognize that. And I think for me, being here in Busan for my first time, I have found Chong. And it is really wonderful to think that I now have so many new friends here. So I think that's the, all the time that we have today. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm actually from Busan, so it's really special for me to welcome you to my hometown. So thank you for your time, Commissioner Fan. Thank you for having me.